Good afternoon, Honorable Chairperson and our distinguished speakers. I welcome you all back to yet another very informative session on road safety needs at the 5th Transport India 2019. I now take the privilege of inviting Dr. Kamal Soy, Member NRSC, Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, Government of India. Sir, can we please have you up on the stage? And I request you to briefly introduce our distinguished speakers at the dais. Good afternoon, Namaskar, Pranam, Salaam Alaikum, Adab. As usual, road safety attracts very few participants. I don't know why. I've always found this film. You know, last time when you were with me, last but last. And there also we found oh, hardly 15, 20 people listening to us. But OK. Uh, now we have a very, very di distinguished panel. We have Mr. Phil Allen, Vice President, Sales Tom Tom. Phil's responsibility is to take the TomTom -tom brand forward in the Southeast Asia and Oceania region in regard to the licensing of our map and traffic product offerings, including the development of web and mobile applications. His key focus is on enterprise and government traffic engineering, geospatial fleet operators, and web and mobile developers. May I invite Phil Allen? Have a seat. Then we have uh, one very handsome gentleman sitting there, Ryan Gayman, Vice President Partnerships Robotics. Name is very interesting, huh? Robotics. Good. Ryan leads Robotics efforts to be a customer centric company as well as their strategic partnerships. He brings a cross sector background to Robotics. Prior to joining the team, he was a principal partner at Citizen City, a social impact business development consulting firm. He has also held positions in academia, advisor and director of the Office of Academic Community Engagement in the University of Pittsburgh, and Ran holds a degree in urban studies and anthropology from the University of Pittsburgh. And I was given to understand he's doing a lot of work in Surat and Bangalore. Gentlemen, can we have Ryan? Dr. Amit Gupta is not here. Then we have Mr. Mahesh Razoria, General Manager, Maruti Suzuki India Limited and Director, IDTR. Mahesh Razoria has extensive experience of over 30 years in various functions of automobile industry like manufacturing, information technology, marketing, and CRM. He is postgraduate in industrial engineering from IIT Delhi. Currently heading the drive, driving training division at Maruti Suzuki India Limited and Director of Institute of Driving and Traffic Research. Very interesting. There are seven such institutes which are in managed by Maruti Suzuki in collaboration with central and state governments. His team at Maruti Suzuki has established over 475 driving schools, centers, and institutes across India which train over 1.5 lakh new drivers and 5 lakh existing drivers every year. Gentlemen and ladies, Mr. Mahesh Razoria. Now we have a gentleman who has uh, taken the pledge of saving lives on road, and he is Payush Tiwari, founder and CEO of Save Life Foundation. Payush Tiwari is the founder and CEO of Save Life Foundation, a non-profit organization committed to improving road safety and access to emergency medical care across India. SLF combines system change advocacy with on-ground interventions to save lives on Indian roads. It is best known getting India a good Smartian law that insulate lay rescuers of injured victims from, syst uh, from systemic harassment and intimidation. It is also catered with delivering a dramatic 30% drop in fatalities last year on one of India's most dangerous roads. Well done. The Mumbai Pune Express, the Mumbai Pune Expressway with plans to make it 100% fatality free by 2021. Payush holds a master's public administration from Harvard Kennedy School and a bachelor's degree in information technology from Delhi University. He is an Ashoka Fellow and Equine Guarding Fellow and Rolex Laureate. Mr. Payush Tiwari, ladies and gentlemen. The 
topic uh, which we are going to discuss today is road safety needs and road safety needs in Indian context. India is a country with 1.3 billion population. I was in a conference in China where I heard a noise, a big voice, India is number one. And once you hear that noise, India is number one, Yo, good, with pride we look at, we look up. And then the next sentence shocked me. India is number one in road fatalities, in road accidental deaths in the world. We are contributing about approximately 11% of road fatalities of the world. We lose around 150,000 people every year on the roads. Over 500,000 people get seriously injured and crippled for life. This data is a data which is given by our ministry. But WHO says we lose much more than that. We lose around 220,000 people. And this is a massive loss, ladies and gentlemen. And we lose people, young, valuable human resource. We lose people in the age bracket of 19 to 40. That is approximately 60% of the people, they lose their life in this age group. And Payush uh, Tawadi, the CEO of Save Life Foundation, he struggled hard for bringing a law called Good Smartian Law. And Good Smartian Law says that even if you help a accident victim on the road, nothing will be said to you, you will not be prosecuted, you will not be asked questions, you will not be asked to stay back, you can just help a road accident victim and can move on. But in reality, the ground reality is different. We don't like to smear our hands with blood. We don't like to touch the road accident victims. As I was uh, uh, coming with my driver, he was telling me, Sir, don't you think dinosaurs are eating their own kids? Dinosaurs eat their own kids. And maybe in India, we are killing our own people on the roads. Are we not? And even if we hit them, we don't look at them after. And people, they speed, speed away. At times, yes, maybe if a truck driver or a bus driver or the vehicle uh, or the, the driver of a commercial vehicle stay back, he may be killed by the mob. I was uh, living a lecture in a university. The few people asked me, sir, if I take a road accident victim to a hospital, then police will ask me a lot of questions. And they may lodge a case against me as well. I put my question back. Is the life of a person more important than the case being lodged? We are saving a human life. <sighs> yes. Road safety needs, I always uh, compare it with five M's. It is not that 3M company, it's five M's. First M is the man who is the driver. The second M is the machine which is being driven. May it be two-wheeler, may it be four-wheeler. Third M is the medium that is the road where it is being driven. Fourth M is the medical care which comes after a crash happens. And fifth M is the management of all these four, four M's. And I believe Today we are going to talk about all these road safety needs which are required to be fulfilled to save human lives. And I'm sure each one of you should, who are sitting here, should sympathize with the people who are losing their life mercilessly. In India we lose a jumbo jet every day. We lose over 500 people. And while the, by the time I'll go to my seat and call someone else, we might have lost many lives. 
and let's all sitting here become um, um, ambassadors of road safety and spread this message that safety saves let us save human lives let us see that no one dies in front of us because of a road crash let us see this mass massacre happening on indian road is stopped let us see that the drivers are well trained let us see that the vehicles we are driving are safe we are not driven by the mileage being given by the vehicles we are driven by the safety which pro, uh, which a vehicle provides let us see that the roads where we are moving on those vehicles are safe let us see that the medical care is well in time the world time is 20 minutes let us see that we uh, touch that time let us see that all the road safety efforts are managed in such a way to reduce suf suffering and misery to human lives thank you very much and now i'll take this uh, opportunity to invite mr phil allen vice president sales tom tom apac and the timing is 10 minutes please come right, thank you um, firstly, yeah, just to endorse um, what was just being said, every 25 seconds there is another death on the roads around the world. That is significant. It's not just an India problem, it's a global problem. Sure, India is right up there, but um, you know, we need to deal with it as a technology challenge globally. All right? And TomTom Tom has an objective to get to zero deaths on the road. That's our passion. We are very focused on that around autonomous driving, being able to reduce congestion, reduce emissions. And our goal and our approach to do this is to look at how we can use our map data, how we can use our, the way we collect data, the way we use live traffic data, and the way we use historical traffic data to achieve this. And we need to deal with it both at a driver perspective and at a traffic management perspective, all right? Uh, both areas. So from a driver perspective, we want to assist in the car. And the way we can do that is by improving our mapping quality. TomTom Tom now is delivering maps um, incrementally every five minutes, all right? As, as up, sorry, what am I saying? Every week um, to our clients. Right? We can stream map data. Um, the idea is to try and deal with issues in the car as you're driving. For example, electronic horizon. Right? The, uh, that is the concept of where you do not see what's just over the hill in front of you. You're not sure of the conditions. So if we use more of the sensors in the car, so for example, the window wipers are going, we know it's wet, we know the inclination of the road, we know the angle of the turn on the road. We therefore know, the car knows, that you shouldn't be driving, say, at the normal posted speed limit. Under these conditions, you should be maybe driving only at 60% of that. So by alerting the driver, keeping the driver informed, we can assist. The same as the concept in fully connected cars coming up to an intersection. The car can know what cars are coming from a blind angle from this angle, from this angle. It can inform you, it can know about cars behind you, around the side of you. So if the car is more informed, what we're starting to see now is more sensors in the car about that. If we can do more accurate positioning of the car, streaming information on our high definition maps, so the car knows which lane it's in and where those vehicles are. So these are the, some of the areas that we can assist. Also, we're involved in programs such as um, the road assessment programs which uh, go and rate roads on personal risk. So we're involved in field data collecting. We use our mobile mapping cars to collect information on the shape of the road, the edges of the road, going down the verges, is there a ditch? Where are the power poles? Where are the barriers? Where are certain signposts? Because if you come off a road at high speed, if the power poles are too close to the road and the spacing's there, you've got an incredibly high chance you're going to hit a power pole. So therefore, if we can rate these roads on personal risk and highlight to the authorities that these roads need to be improved to lower that personal risk, then we get safer roads. Because humans, humans will make mistakes, all right? You know, the ultimate is obviously to get to uh, autonomous vehicles where we take the human out of the whole scenario but that's a staged program. We're not going to be there in a few years, all right? You'll hear about it, and we're seeing more and more sensors, but to fully get there is a long time away, all right? So we can do these things with our map data now. 
but we can also assist at the traffic management perspective and the traffic engineering perspective. So TomTom Tom has real-time traffic, because one of the issues is people are in a rush, especially if they get caught in a jam, they've got to get an appointment on time. They're going to rush and try and get out of that jam. If we can better inform drivers of jams, they can make better decisions. They can make better planning about their time. But we also know that if we have more connected cars, we can actually improve that driving experience. So TomTom's Tom about having that traffic data real time to help do that. Now come back to the traffic management side. If they are more informed, they can make better decisions when they start seeing congestion building up and deal with trying to minimize that stress for drivers. So the more we can share that information around real-time data, real-time traffic, real-time congestion, seeing the congestion build up, we do that in live, we can measure the jam length, we can measure the jam time. We can monitor the lifetime of a jam, so we can actually do predictions every minute to tell you how that jam is performing. Is it getting worse, significantly worse, starting to stabilize, starting to improve? So traffic management can make decisions about the resources they need to resolve that. We can also publish this data on VMS signs, right? Variable messaging. We have a trial underway in Pune that's been running for quite a period of time now. Uh, we are about to start another one in another smart city. You know, being able to get messages to drivers through VMS is very, very powerful. Another major area of using our historical traffic data, and this is one of the big strengths, is to do return on investment, all right? To be able to go and look at a specific incident or a specific black spot or a known issue on a road and do some engineering to work out how to improve that and then be able to evaluate the performance of that road net before the works and after the works. All right. So if you've got a serious incident, look at it. If you've got a serious black spot, if you've got a serious performance issues. But whenever you're doing engineering changes, it could be as simple as traffic light phasing, that uh, you're getting a lot of problems with people rushing lights. Maybe you need to monitor the turn maneuvers through that intersection. Understand that. So you can look at the historical data. You can go back. We have four years of data in India. All right? You can go back and look at that data, analyze it, see how people are maneuvering, how people are behaving, and then try to come up with engineering or um, tactical approaches to resolve uh, the behavior going through those intersections. So that's what TomTom's about, using our maps, using our live data, using our historical data, using route monitoring, all these tools to assist both traffic management and the uh, passengers or the drivers themselves. Thanks. Wonderful. This was uh, really very fast and maybe you took care of time. Now we have another uh, panelist with us. He just joined Dr. Amit Gupta. He is Professor of Surgery, Division of Trauma Surgery and Critical Care, JPN Apex Trauma Center. Dr. Amit Gupta is currently working as Professor of, at the Division of uh, The years just keep sitting. We have, we have a, uh, yeah, yeah, we have a panel, yeah. I'm just introducing you to the people. Dr. Amit Gupta is working as professor at the Division of Trauma Surgery and Critical Care, JPN Apex Trauma Center, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. After graduating medicine in 1993, he did his master's in surgery from King's George Medical University, India in 1997 and joined AIMS in 1998 and since then has been there in various capacities. We will hear more from him when his turn comes. Now may I invite Mr. Ryan Gayman to start his opening comments. Thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our company, Roadbotics. So we're a software and uh, data science company based out of the U.S., but we operate in 14 countries, one of which is here uh, in India, specifically in, in, in Surat and uh, Bangalore. Uh, and, and what we do is we help governments, which across the world have to manage about 40 million miles of roads, actually have the data they need to make better decisions around pavement improvement, road, road maintenance, and, and road monitoring. 
an interesting little fact that, that so if we think about how government officials uh, make decisions about where to fix potholes or where to put all of the resources of our tax dollars into improving roads, where, where do they know how to do this? How do they know how to make these decisions? The process is, it gets down to a fundamental question of what is the condition of our road networks? And in India, when you're having to manage hundreds of thousands of kilometers of roads, that's an incredibly challenging problem. And government officials are put in a really difficult spot, especially if any of you right now get on Twitter or WhatsApp and you look at, you search pothole, you'll see all the things that come up about citizens complaining about road conditions. I've never met one government official that is happy about potholes or how their citizens are looking at, at, at the conditions of their roads. But it's incredibly difficult to manage them. Uh, the way in which we understand the conditions of our roads around the world hasn't changed for thousands of years. Fun fact, Julius Caesar's first job was actually as a pavement inspector, looking at the road surfaces. Uh, it, 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 it hasn't changed. Instead of, instead of using a, a pickup truck, he was on a, a horse and chariot looking down at the road surface, writing something, sending that back to the local official, telling them where the road needed to be improved. That is fundamentally how we still look at our road conditions and make decisions around road improvement. Um, our company, Roadbotics, I'm, I'm the vice president of partnerships uh, for the company, uh, has completely changed that uh, in a way that's both affordable, but most importantly, objective in the data that we provide. Uh, simply, simply put, we just take a standard smartphone, mount it into the windshield of any passenger vehicle that, that any of you could be driving, and collect image data of the road surface. But instead of having a person look at that data and make a judgment about what that road condition is, we use cutting edge image processing, so deep learning, where we've trained a machine in the two dozen odd distresses that a pavement engineer has been trained over the course of their life to look for. We then apply that machine learning to each one of those images for every three meters, whether that's 100 kilometers or 100,000 kilometers to generate a, a one through five condition rating that we provide back to our customers and our partners through an interactive map. So now not only do government officials have a complete image library of their entire road network, they know the condition of their roads down to every three meters. So that's powerful data to help them go back and say, this is where we need to fix the potholes. This is where we need to fix uh, or where we need to do new construction or new, no, new road maintenance or road management. So I guess the question might be, why, why am I here in a, in a, as part of a panel talking about road safety? And, and simply put, I, 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 whether we're talking about traffic fatalities, whether we're talking about, uh, we were talking about distracted driving before, all the things we think about uh, in terms of improving road safety in India and around the world, let's not forget about the, the roadways that we physically drive on. Uh, whether that is uh, road conditions and, and, a, and a vehicle running into them causing a crash that could lead to a fatality, or if you're swerving away from, from the, the, the road surfaces and trying to move away from a, a pothole or other sort of distress that could cause another kind of accident. Our, 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 our officials that are tasked with, with managing and monitoring these roads need our support as citizens, as companies, to have better data uh, to ultimately improve them. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm eager, to, I won't take too much longer, I'm, I'm eager to hear the rest of the, the panelists give their presentation and ultimately have a discussion on this. Uh, but, but what we ultimately need to consider in these sorts of discussions on road safety in the future is the physical infrastructure that we travel every day. Remember, 40 million kilometers of roads around the world, and we now possess the technology as people to actually understand what the health and the condition of those roads are at any given point in time on any given meter of that, of that roadway. So let's apply technology, whether it's the, 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 the road traffic condition technology that TomTom Tom provides, or, or, whether it's, or whether it's our condition data, and let's finally, for the first time in really human history, let's not wait another 2,000 years uh, to have good condition roads. Let's start working on that now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we all believe that road conditions is very, very important to reduce road fatalities, as well as uh, the traffic conditions like uh, Ellen was saying, very, very important. Now we have uh, one gentleman who, whose role comes after a road crash happens. Uh, may I invite Dr. Amit Gupta for his opening remarks? Thank you, Dr. Kamal, and thanks for the organizers for uh, having invited me here. And, uh, as uh, aptly, you know, sort of mentioned, 
uh, our role as trauma surgeons and doctors come at the end and that's why probably it's one of the pillars which comes at the end of the uh, global road safety uh, decade which is the pillar five nonetheless um, we see a lot of you know sort of unnecessary suffering which is brought on to humankind uh, in the hospitals and more so not only the mortality uh, or, or the deaths due to ro uh, unsafe roads is a matter of concern obviously it is but the amount of disabled persons we are producing each year uh, is even worse because according to one statistics for each single death there are 30 severely injured patients which would have certain amount of disability and cannot go back to the society as a normal human being and that's a cause of greater concern because these are the people who will be dependent upon the society uh, till the time they live. Um, it is 100% preventable, we all know the statistics, we are the road traffic death capital. Uh, but what I want to tell you is that Apart from the, um, you know, sort of uh, manpower loss we are having of young men who are dying uh, on Indian roads, uh, tremendous amount of economic, uh, you know, sort of uh, deficit, uh, so um, or, or physical deficit the country is facing because very, very young people die and what happens to their families and I mean, I have personally and we at trauma centers see at least a couple of patients every week uh, going below poverty line just because they had to pay out of the pocket expenses to get themselves treated. Uh, ARTS obviously is a, uh, is a national institute and we do provide, try to provide f uh, free care, but not all people in India uh, have that kind of a luxury or to have uh, free care after the accident. So somewhere down the line we also have to think about the economics of, uh, of road injuries uh, per se. As far as a doctor is concerned, I am concerned about the system which will take care of the person after he has met with a road traffic injury or, uh, or an accident. And therefore, my view of a smart city would be uh, an easy access for anybody uh, who is on the road to medical care. Uh, medical care which is coming promptly and is also uh, up to the mark in terms of uh, training. Uh, that means well qualified paramedics coming in good ambulances uh, taking the person to the most appropriate nearest facility. Now it is very easy to say in one line that trauma systems is all about bringing the right patient to the right facility in the right time for the right kind of care. That's what trauma system mean. But it is a very complex system. Try to imagine a person who is on the road, first he has to access a number or, or a pre-hospital care provider. The pre-hospital care provider with the right kind of ambulance has to come there, has to take care on site, on route, till the time the patient is delivered to a designated trauma center. Now this is multiple teams working at multiple places uh, and the patient is single. So these are complex problems and we are still struggling in India with these problems although the 108 ambulance system which started in Andhra uh, about 15 years back is there as a model and about 26 or 27 states have adopted that particular model of pre-hospital care but still a lot is lacking. Uh, they do not give their audits so, so basically there is no re regulatory component for pre-hospital care still in India because we do not have an EMS law or legislation. So I think the first thing which uh, the states should enact is an EMS or a medical law. Uh, which not only gives the right to treatment to the patient but also uh, you know defines the roles of a pre-hospital care provider, the hospital, the doctors within the hospital only then probably a significant change can happen in the medical systems as such. The other problem within the hospitals even if a patient is brought within time to the hospital is the hospital itself. Now we are not geared up for trauma as yet. Uh, as a speciality, trauma surgery has just begun about five years back at AIMS. We need many more institutions in India to produce trauma surgeons, just like neurosurgeons or orthosurgeons. We need trauma surgeons who can take care of the patient from head to toe. Now we as uh, AIMS 
uh, faculty are trying to you know build up the medical council of india has already approved a degree of ms for trauma surgeons so i think uh, the next decade or two will be very exciting in the terms of developing a whole cadre of new doctors who cater to trauma from head to toe uh, obviously the other aspect uh, apart from the care giving uh, is the rehab because once you have treated the patient within the hospital and he is disabled whether due to head injury or spinal cord injury or due to amputations these patients frequently require rehabilitation what we have to think uh, as a policy is having rehabilitation centers which are attached to the acute trauma centers so that long term rehab can be given to these patients and these patients can go back to do, through the, to the society as as productive human beings um uh, others i will not go into the details because we already have uh, people from the police uh, and the manufacturing units of of cars uh, what they have to do as enforcement agencies but definitely as medical professional i would like to see uh, that uh, a seamless transition of a patient is there from the site of injury to the hospital and thereafter uh, to the rehabilitation uh, services Uh, the other key component of a smart city which i uh, have perceived over the years is that we need to have a data collection we have now aadhar cards we have now you know sort of single numbers for all the citizens so i think data should flow from the pre hospital care or the police data into the hospital because till now and i'm working on trauma registries for the past uh, uh, 15 years or so what we have seen is that there are huge data gaps so although we know that these number of patients die we still do not know how many of the patients actually die within the hospital uh, what is the mortality rate in various hospitals for trauma patients so i think there need to be a, a data harmonization between the pre hospital care or the police as well as the hospital so that we are actually uh, able to get the tangible number as to what problem we are facing with so i think with that i'll end and and i think there's a lot of data harmony to be done and that's what smart cities are all about that's what i have seen in the west um uh, uh, great trauma systems uh, in north america also victorian trauma system in australia is again a, a role model for for all of us to follow so i think uh, there's a lot of work to be done uh, and the principal uh, work has to be done on on data harmonization thank you so much we can have questions maybe after we can have if anybody can have questions that you can have a list of the question which you can ask the panelist and now may i invite mr mahesh rajoria general manager maruti suzuki india limited and director idtr thank you sir thank you uh in the beginning doctor so he has mentioned about some statistics of uh, road crashes and fatalities on uh, indian roads quite a few years some statistics but you know uh, we are losing almost 1.4 to 1.5 lakh people every year and this has been happening for last 9 years since 2010 it is happening it's almost at the same level so i am afraid that uh, this thing is becoming normal and we tend to we are tending to accept this ki okay road crashes happen people die but at least i am safe see human life is very very important and we have to make efforts to save human lives i'll be talking about uh, education part of uh, road safety uh, maruti suzuki has been in this uh, arena for last uh, 20 years now and uh, we have trained almost uh, 10 million people in uh, safe driving currently we have about uh, 500 institutes or schools or centers uh, teaching about road safety education is one of the pillars like uh, normally mod talks about four e's like dr soi talked about m's so there are four e's also uh, four e's are you must be knowing uh, enforcement engineering education and emergency care 
education is a weakest link in my opinion because not much uh, uh, thought has gone on this why i'm saying that i can share you with the uh, share uh, share some thought with you we have a center in gurgaon and which has been set up in collaboration with the gurgaon police and what they do when they challan a person for violating a traffic law and the challan is not settled on the road then they ask them to come to their office and clear the challan but when they come to the office they say that there is a training center upstairs go there take training and come back then your challan will be cleared that training center is run by maruti maruti means uh, idtr and maruti now when the person comes there he is very perturbed why my time is being wasted why i know how to drive and uh, uh, why, why what 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 training will help me and all those things and they fight like anything but then there is no choice he has to attend and otherwise challan will not be cleared so he comes in and sits there but when he comes out of the training he says yes i didn't know about this i am not aware of this had i been aware of this the challan would not have happened the people understand this that education is important but they don't have means to get it so what i am trying to say is today we are woefully uh, lacking in the educational infrastructure for driving training we can cater today our driving training school can cater to only 12% of the people who get new driving license the rest of them how do they learn you must be knowing somebody of you some of you must have learned from your your uh, brother your father or somebody right what they can teach you they can teach you only skill how to control car and uh, and whatever mistake they make they transfer it to you right we never get uh, to get training about what should be our attitude when we are on road we don't have knowledge about uh, uh, about road road rules people don't know what are the meaning of road uh, the, those lines which are drawn on the road except of course the zebra crossing but we tend to drive and uh, park our vehicle on the zebra crossing anyway these are the things which need to be told to everyone so that the fatalities so that we are safe on the road and fatalities can be reduced uh, i would like to i would like to point out four points uh, for your consideration uh, how education can be focused upon one is of course we should have good driving schools how do we create those driving schools driving schools are set up uh, under law and they have to follow certain rules and regulation specified in central motor vehicle rule or any motor vehicle rule and uh, people have to set up that and uh, Uh, train people give classes and then the person is ready for uh, driving and he goes for licensing all these but the quality of driving school is there is nobody in country who is monitoring quality of driving schools or driving training few states have tried uh, uh, some experimentation like grading of schools based on uh, based on the infrastructure they have based on the trainers they have so this is one thing which uh, uh, which is needed so that public people know which driving school is good and uh, then join it and then that will force the uh, other low quality driving school to become high quality driving school the second point is that the trainer trainer is a very important uh, aspect of training everybody loves uh, a good trainer remembers whole life and uh, uh, whatever he is Uh, his teaching that uh, is uh, life's uh, teaching for a driver today cmvr only gives you that this should be the qualification of a trainer 
but trainer like a school teacher need to be trained somewhere there is no certification for driving school trainers there is no way there is no course curriculum specified anywhere for a driving trainer so that is another point which need to be uh, thought about third important aspect is the driving license today i mean uh, things are changing but uh, uh, at my age people know how we got a driving license we just go there apply it and get it but today times are changing that uh, there is somebody who ask you to drive the vehicle checks it and uh, then gives but the checking there is no uh, you know how it is checked but you know in under cmbr there are 40 point checklist more than 40 point checklist for a driver for a new driver to drive to be certified and then the license should be given so my third point is there should be stringent test for driving licensing unless people undergo test they will not understand the importance of training and the fourth point is that today our rtus they are responsible for everything registering the vehicle overloading uh driving license driving school license penalties and maintaining a big uh, a large uh, number of staff so rtus are overworked and they don't have focus on driving training or driving schools so my suggestion is that uh, we should actively consider making a separate agency from rto so that the focus is only on driving training and driving licensing so the quality of drivers the safe drivers come on road and help in reduction of uh, accidents and fatalities uh see the focus on uh, improving these things will actually help in improving the increase in the participation of people and that will help in further improvement in uh, uh, road safety thank you very much thank you very much mr mahesh rajori we have various questions what will be ask, asking after payush tiwari ji is founder and ceo save life foundation thank you hi everyone thanks for uh, uh, being here today thanks to exhibitions india uh, and the organizers for um, organizing this session um, a lot of the people on the panel are people i have admired for many many years for the amazing work uh, that they've been doing um, so it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, on 11th uh, september last year uh, sometime uh, during the day i think it was about uh, 12 uh, 30 pm uh i got a call from uh mr t krishna prasad who's the dgp uh, of telangana state and uh, basically he told me that a bus uh, carrying close to 100 people uh had gone down uh, um a hill and so far about 58 people uh, had been killed and uh, they wanted uh, support uh, and assistance from save life foundation to find out what had really happened so my immediate response to him that we will have our crash investigation team um uh, on the plane as soon as um uh, we can and within um 8 hours of that conversation uh just before nightfall our team uh, of uh, three uh, scientific crash investigators had arrived uh on that scene in jagtial telangana when they arrived on the scene um and they looked at the police papers around the crash um they saw what they were expecting uh, they knew that police was going to tag that crash as a case of negligence of the driver and uh basically say that this was an accident but as we all know who work in the area of road safety that 
crashes that happen on the roads are not accidents. They are crashes, and majority of them are preventable. So we went about our investigation uh, nonetheless. Um, so what we discovered uh, following our investigation was that this bus, uh, which, was, uh, which had about 100 people, uh, but a capacity of only 41, was coming down a hill, returning from the Jagtial temple. And uh, at some point uh, while it was coming down, the driver of the bus realized that uh, the brakes of the vehicle had failed. We found that we could correlate that from the scene because just before there were three speed breakers and uh, before none of the speed breakers, uh, before the fall, there was a tread mark. There was no tire marks to show that a brake had been applied. Then we also saw the crash, crash guards that were on the side of the road and the crash guards had been crushed sideways. So it told us that there was an attempt that was made to slow down the bus by sliding it against the crash guard. And uh, at the point of fall, uh, again, we didn't find any brake marks. We only found tire marks at the edge of the hill from where the bus uh, had fallen down. When we looked at the bus, we saw that there was catastrophic damage. Uh, but the bus had not fallen uh, that deep. It only fell about 20 feet uh, and stopped. So how could 61 people have been killed in such a crash? And we were able to correlate that to the fact that there were uh, only two ejections from the bus, only two people fell out from the bus. And remaining almost everyone, as later postmortem reports confirmed, had suffocated inside the bus, caught and not being able to get out. So not many of them had uh, crash injuries. Uh, majority of them died from suffocation because the bus was over capacity and packed. The other thing that uh, the me local media started doing was to, uh, before we arrived on the scene, was to talk about the driver's record, about how bad the driver had been, and uh, you know how he could have prevented the fall, and he did not, and it was completely driver's fault. And what our investigation revealed was that, if anything, the driver was a hero, because in that journey of 200 meters before the fall, the driver had at least 10 opportunities to jump from the bus. And instead of jumping from the bus, the driver steered the bus, tried to slow it down, tried to slide it against the crash barriers, and eventually went down with the bus and died. So we were able to negate almost every aspect of the typical theory, any crash you pick up. The typical theory is that it's because of negligence of the driver, of any one driver involved, if it's two vehicles, and the deaths were therefore due to negligence. What our investigation told us, and when we plotted the entire incident on Hayden's matrix, what we discovered was that the cause of crash was brake failure. The cause of death were missing crash barriers at the point of fall, and the overcapacity or, or the or the over um, uh, you know packed bus uh, situation that was there. That told us that there was an infrastructure element involved, which was the crash barrier or the missing crash barrier. And there was a systemic and a vehicular element involved, which was the uh, overcapacity of the bus uh, or the bus being overpacked. Post our recommendations now, uh, those, uh, all of the crash barriers have been replaced with Jersey wall barriers so that uh, no such incident happens in the future. But 61 people had to lose their life for that intervention, had to, uh, for the intervention to happen. The point I'm trying to make is that we can all keep talking about road safety for the next 20 years, but unless we fix the way in which we collect data from the crashes, we will never actually know what the cause of the crash was. If we were to believe the police report in that case, we would have said, okay, it was the driver's fault, so let's all invest the next 100 crores on driver's training, right? The biggest challenge facing road safety in the country today is lack of understanding as to what is really causing these crashes in the first place. And the only way to find that out is to institute scientific investigation of road crashes. I see there are a number of students here. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing some of you are engineering students, uh, maybe not. But crash is a science, or crash investigation is a science, and that is something that must be instituted 
to make our cities and our, uh, our, our highways safe. We talk about smart cities, but let me ask you guys a question. Is an unsafe city or can an unsafe city ever be a smart city? I can't hear you. Can an unsafe city ever be a smart city? It can't be, right? So in order to make our cities smart, we first have to make them safe at a very basic level. And the most basic level of a city being safe is the roads of that city. And in order to make them safe, we need to get into the science of what caused the crash to happen in the first place and fix that. About three years ago, we picked up the Mumbai Pune Expressway, which was one of the deadliest roads in the country. The average death rate on Indian highways is one death every two kilometers every year. The average death rate on, on uh, Mumbai Pune Expressway was 200% more than that. So three deaths every two kilometers every year. Today, we have been able to reduce deaths on the Mumbai Pune Expressway by 30% purely and purely through crash investigation that told us that there were engineering errors, that there were vehicular issues, and that there were human factors. And we were able to carry out a targeted intervention to make sure that we fix them. So for example, on the infrastructure side, we discovered that the 94.5 kilometer stretch had 2,150 engineering errors. We fixed 1,100 of them over the last couple of years, leading to a 30% drop in deaths today. There were issues with trauma care, there were issues with, uh, uh, with police enforcement, there were issues with the way people were driving, but we, the crash data told us where to focus. Whether we should focus on seat belts or whether we should focus on something else. So my only appeal to you today is that uh, you may or may not work in the area of road safety, but you all use the roads. We all use the roads, our families use the roads. If anybody ever asks you what's, what's the solution to road crashes in India, I think the solution starts at getting the right data and getting the right investigation done off these road crashes so we know actually what is really going on and then look at the solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much all panelists. Now, may I ask audience a question? Have you ever broken traffic rules? How many of you raise your hands? Oh, just few of you, huh? Rest, you follow all traffic rules. Say yes or no. You follow all traffic rules? Just five, six hands went up. They says we don't, we have broken rules. So rest, you all follow traffic rules. Very nice. That's why India is so safe. That's, no? There are two fears in road safety. If we are able to instill two fears, we are able to reduce number of crashes. One fear is, if you are breaking a rule, fear of being caught, F-O-B-C. And once you are caught, then another fear is F-O-B-P, fear of being punished. But what happens? Leave Delhi, maybe Delhi may be a different uh, scenario, but if you go countryside to uh, Bihar, UP, Punjab, Haryana, once you are caught, you will start your uh, mobile phone and say, talk to the MLA, talk to the minister, talk to the cooperator, and you are scot free. No? This happens or not? So my, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss now, we have a panel discussion. I'll just discuss with uh, Mr. Mahesh Razoria. I have a few questions. Mr. Razoria, we have uh, around 35 crores of driving licenses, about 35 crores. And this data is not authenticated. This data is, uh, uh, but uh, very close to around 90, 95%. I've taken from RTAs that how many licenses we have. Out of 35 crore licenses, I just want to uh, share a small story with all of you. We were doing a study on, uh, from Bhopal to Mumbai. And we asked the drivers of these truckers, the commercial drivers, that you show me your license. Because we are doing a study that how you drive. He says, sir, which license do you show? Which one has license do you So he was in Bhopal. He showed me a license of Madhya Pradesh. I said, you have another license? He says, yes. I have a license of Gujarat. 
I have a license of Maharashtra. I have a license of Delhi. I said, okay, you have these four licenses. Where is the original one? He says, the original one is lying at home. So, yes, yes you take on that. Uh, yes, you are right that uh, it is easier to make uh, licenses, very easy to make license. Uh, uh, you, you can have multiple licenses because the systemic checks are not there. Now the things are changing. Uh, Morth has tried to make the Sarthi database and where you ha your licenses are being captured. And uh, you cannot have duplicate license and all those things are being, come, be, uh, are being done. But the most important thing is how to get the license. License is gotten by, as I explained, uh, by giving a test to motor vehicle inspector and he signs and you get the license. It's all manual process. So you contact Gujarat MBI, you get license there. You contact Madhya Pradesh MBI, you get uh, license there. There is no check. Now, and, and then there is, a, uh, uh, there is a human bias saying, okay, uh, either check, not check, you get the license. But things have changed a lot. Uh, Morth has actually, uh, MORTH is Ministry of Road Transport and Highway, has actually told the states to automate the licensing system. And uh, there are states where the system exists. In Delhi also, the system has been made. And uh, first such system has come in uh, Sarai Kalika, where a person has to undergo a test uh, under the cameras. Now, cameras are not just camera for uh, taking video or uh, uh, photograph. They are sensors. They, they check how you drive. When, we, when you pass through certain formation, whether you hit the curb or you uh, reverse the vehicle unnecessarily or wait for a long time, that's all captured by those sensing cameras and a report is generated about your skill of driving. And based on that report, the driving license is given. There is no human intervention. And the good news is, I mean, it may be bad news for you, for many of you, uh, that 40% of people fail. Earlier, 100% people were getting the license. Now 40% are failing. So they are uh, trying to get the license by getting trained on, onto that system and or whatever. So the things are improving, but yes, it, uh, we have to go a long way. Thank you very much. Now I have a question for uh, Phil Allen. Phil, uh, how you, you know, India, people says we are a country of jams and country of deaths. We lose 150,000 people on roads because of road crashes and we lose around 150,000 crore of rupees because of traffic congestion. How your, uh, this solution can help in reducing traffic congestion? Hello, yeah. Um, well, the best challenge here is, as I said before, um, congestion causes stress. So we need to be able to reduce that. One of the ways is, firstly, is trying to give people choices you know, when to drive, by looking at the congestion, um, and maybe I shouldn't drive now because of the high congestion, or maybe how I spread the loading on the network. So it's a, a safer experience, because we want to make driving less stressful, more comfortable, and a relaxed experience. So that's the first thing. So we need to inform drivers. If we can better inform drivers, they can make better decisions. That's the first part. The second part is obviously helping the highway authorities, the road controlling authorities, to better manage the roads, to better make decisions on the engineering, to make it more streamlined. A uh, good example is we're working on uh, intersection analysis at the moment, so therefore it's not a stop-start all the way along um, from intersection to intersection, where we can try and optimise the journey uh, that people take, so that we use intelligence to look at queue lengths um, at each intersection and try to optimise and minimise that stop, that delay, and not have people trying to rush, rush through a red light, all that side of it. You know, we've got to make this easy for people and make it uh, comfortable and safe. 
Thank you. Like we were saying, you know, the road surface, road is very, very important. And United Nations Decade of Action says, uh, in one of the pillars, one pillar is, uh, is safer roads. Even Payush was saying this safer roads leads to safer uh, mobility and safer people. So we have uh, Mr. R this question is to Ryan. Ryan, in India, we lost around 10,000 people, 10,000 lives because of potholes. How you can uh, suggest or uh, how your technology can help in uh, reducing this number of deaths due to potholes? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and my, the point that I brought up earlier, that if you search Twitter right now with road conditions in, in, in India, it's the number one thing that you get are, are potholes. Now, this might be slightly controversial, but if you look at all of the data that we, that we have as a company, on the, in, not just in India, but across the world, potholes make up less than 1% of the distresses that are actually present. But yet we talk about them so much because you swerve away from them or you hit them and they cause the greatest amount of damage. Um, but yet our customers, our partners, everybody wants information about pothole identification and, and, and these sorts of things, um, which is critical. We have to put patches on them. You have to fix them because they are so dangerous. Um, what we want to do with our data and, and, and the point earlier about w without having a fundamental understanding and better data of what's going on, we can't actually make solutions. What we want to be able to provide with comprehensive condition data about road surfaces is to move away from governments having to be reactive with things like potholes and to be able to have better data about all of the other distresses that happen before a pothole ever occurs. So as I mentioned before, there's two dozen odd distresses that a trained pavement engineer, when they're making an assessment of a roadway, looks for. And when you get to the pothole, that's it. There's no point of return. The way that you fix the pothole truly is fully milling and repaving the surface of that roadway, which is incredibly expensive. If we can give governments better data, which is by virtue of, of what we do with our technology, and you can start to provide preventive, what are called preventive maintenance treatments to things like line cracks or other distresses that are out there that are far cheaper, far cheaper, then what we're doing is not only extending the life of that road surface so that it prevents the catastrophic damage of things like potholes, uh, but we're also extending the budget so that less and less time and resources have to be spent uh, on things like potholes, which are, which are catastrophic. Uh, and more and more resources can be, can be uh, applied to thinking of our road networks like a living organism. Uh, and and if, you, if you think of it in that way before, if, if, you, do, if you take care of yourself, you, 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 you run, you, you, you do well with your, your health in terms of nutrition and all of that, you're extending, you're extending your life. But if you don't do any of that and you get to the doctor and you have all of these maladies, you have all of these problems, uh, and it's, 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 it's not much of a surprise as to, as to why you didn't take care of yourself. Having better data about road conditions you, it will ultimately enable us, as those that are responsible for managing the roadways, to, to, to take better care of them, avoid altogether the situation of having potholes, which ultimately will reduce the, the fatalities or any of the crashes that are associated with them. Yeah, very good answer. Now, uh, while we are discussing about the road surface, world over, for a forgiving infrastructure. We always say that a driver can make errors. But the infrastructure should be such, there should be a compensation for those errors. What is happening in our uh, road infrastructure in India, that we are, we have, we have the concrete structures on the, on the side of the road, we have trees on the side of the road, we have pillars on the sides of the road, and as soon as a driver makes error, is going to get killed. Uh, many of you may be knowing a comedian called Jaspal Bhatti. You know Jaspal Bhatti? Jaspal Bhatti got killed because his son lost control over his car and the car crashed into a tree. So that tree should not have been there, but that tree was there. So we have to create an infrastructure which has inbuilt cushion for these errors. Roads are self-explaining, roads are forgiving, roads are talking. Like he was discussing with me that they are developing shoulders where you get automatic noise of the road. The roads is going to warn you. 
that you are, if you are making mistakes, you may get killed. So wake up. So we have to create an infrastructure which is forgiving, which has a cushion for the errors made by human beings. And now, uh, Dr. Amit Gupta, uh, your role is very, very important after the crash happens. <laughs> like we say, triade, the transportation, the trauma care, and the treatment. Most of us sitting here, whenever we want to help under Good Smartian law, we do not know how to transport a patient. We normally try to lift a patient in different angles. Can, can you just brief our audience that how should we, what kind of precautions we should take while uh, understanding this triad? No, I think a very important point raised, and I, and I think apart from the Good Samaritan law, a lot of uh, work by Piyush, who's sitting here, has also gone, and his Safe Life Foundation has gone into the first aid training for uh, lay people. And I think uh, transportation of uh, the trauma victims or uh, road crash victims, uh, everybody should know. I mean, in a, if we say that this is 2019, uh, uh, I think in this modern world, everybody of you should know actually or have undergone at least a day's small capsule course on first aid. Um, how many of you actually learned first aid? Just raise their hands. Okay. So, barely minimum, you know, out of uh, this group of around 50, 60 people, hardly three of uh, them raised their hands. And that's the reality. Do you think that you should know uh, first aid? Basic first aid? How many of you would agree to that? Yeah, exactly. All of us do agree that we need to learn about it. Uh, simple things like how to move. I can tell you verbally to, uh, today, you know, sort of how to move a particular person, uh, what are the tenets, how to stop bleeding. Uh, but you will have to undergo a proper, you know, certification course at least of one day. So what we have done along with the WHO, World Health Organization, which asked us and the Ministry of Health to develop a small curriculum for first aid. Now, uh, I'm happy to inform that uh, last uh, two months back, the course finally did come up. Now we are trying to make a trainer's course so that lay people who are good at training can also train the other lay people in that first aid course. That first aid does tell about uh, in general, whenever a pa patient is unconscious, how to handle him. You should not move your neck. The neck of the patient or the neck of the patient should be handled really carefully. The spine of the patient should be handled really carefully because while moving a patient, you might injure the spine, which is still, you know, sort of, uh, sort of primary damage is small, but you might create a secondary damage and lend the patient paraplegic or quadriplegic, which is lifelong. Once the spinal cord in is injured, Nobody can help. The second important thing which is in first aid is to stop the bleeding. There have been campaigns after campaigns about stop the bleeding. But still we, f we see that uh, a lay person who's on the road is busy taking pictures and videos of, uh, per of a person who's bleeding to death on the road. Simple pressure by anything which you have got, a dupatta, a handkerchief, uh, 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 any cloth you can get hold of on the wound, would stop the hemorrhage. 99% of all hemorrhages, if they are from, and most of them are from venous blood, not arterial bleeding, can be stopped by simple pressure bandage. And the third is safely transport, quickly call for help. Now, many a times we do not know the numbers for access of pre-hospital care or police. So I think as, as smart citizens, we should all know where we are and what is the access number for emergency care quickly call them till the time they are able to come, stop the obvious hemorrhage, take the patient uh, out of the uh, dangerous area for your safety and for the patient's safety. Uh, so if he is on the road, take him to a shoulder or to take him to an area, taking care that his spine is not flexed or moved unnecessarily too much. I think these, and, and if you find that there's a fracture, you can use a stick, you can use an umbrella, you can use anything which is available just to splint that part so that that part does not move and further bleeding is stopped. So these are very basic things which, which I think everybody of us should know. But once again, uh, please do as smart citizens go and, and enroll 
uh, there are many institutions including Safe Life Foundation, uh, IRTE, which is the uh, Road, Road Traffic Education Institute, uh, the uh, IRF, which are frequently doing these courses. St. John's Ambulance uh, is there, which does a first aid course. I think all of us should know how to save a life. E in your life, even if you can save one life, one life in the whole lifetime, I think that's, that course will be worth it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. But apart from that, uh, uh, one very, very important related part to this is CPR training. And if uh, you must be, I don't know how many of you are aware of it or not, we lost one president of Abdul Kalam, one ex-president of India, because of not being provided CPR. And nobody was trained for CPR. Uh, I'm really telling you, you are lucky guys, you got a license without undergoing through a first aid training. In the Western world, you cannot get a li driving license without, get, without going through a first aid training. First aid training for a driving license, we are going to uh, promote to the government is must before even you get a driving license. And uh, now the question is to Mr. Piyush Tiwadi. Good smartian law, very, very good. But how can we make it more effective? Is there any plan to have first responders placed everywhere in the country? Or is there any helpline? Suppose one gentleman out of this, all these people, they come across one road dash, and uh, they take them to a hospital. And the hospital staff, OK, they, uh, they, they, they take the patient in, but they ask you to stay back and they inform the police and the police comes and catches you where do you go you study says out of roof that you know good smart in law i also say everybody says good smart in law go and help accident victims but what if if you are harassed if you are questioned or if your cases is assert against you piyush so uh how many of you are aware of the Good Samaritan law in the country? Honestly, how many of you before this session were aware that India has a Good Samaritan law that insulates you from any kind of legal and procedural hassles if you help someone? How many of you were aware? So about 10 odd people, right, in the room. So the challenge is, for all of us, the challenge is how do you tell 1.2 billion people that they have a new right? And how do you tell them that in a cost-effective, speedy manner so that everybody knows that if they were to help somebody and, and an official tries to violate their rights, then they can take action against that. So the first thing is that, uh, again, I would request that since 10 of you know, and now hopefully everybody else in this room also knows, uh, please do go tell at least one more person that if they come forward to help an injured person, uh, they are insulated. Um, we started this fight uh, back in 2012 uh, through the Supreme Court of India. And while Supreme Court issues a lot of directions in many, many cases, in our case, uh, Supreme Court was convinced that they had to use uh, their special constitutional powers, which have been given to them under Article 141, 142 of the Constitution, to enact certain policies and laws uh, in the case of national emergencies or in the case of missing legislations. And the Supreme Court used and invoked Article 141, 142 of the Constitution to actually institute a nationwide binding Good Samaritan law on all the courts of the country, uh, which basically means that uh, the police cannot uh, force you to reveal your details if you take somebody to a hospital or even if you call the helpline for help. The hospital just cannot detain you uh, once you've brought someone. You can leave the person. You can deposit the victim and leave uh, immediately. Uh, Ames Trauma Center is an excellent example of that. Even before the Good Samaritan Law, uh, they had a practice where the person bringing the victim, uh, their details were never asked. It was mentioned, I think, brought by a bystander, uh, you know, simply uh, done for the MLC procedure. Uh, and that is now, uh, has been codified, and that's now actually required by hospitals. They, they can't detain people who are, um, you know, who bring the injured to the uh, hospital. Uh, and finally, uh, court procedures, there is relief. If you yourself admit that you were a witness to that crash, 
uh, and would like to be an eyewitness, then the Supreme Court has prescribed that uh, your examination needs to happen in a single sitting in a single day and you can't be called again and again to the court. Now, as a small nonprofit, we are grappling with the challenge of how do you take this message to the entire country. Uh, the government has tried to carry out some awareness programs. Uh, sometimes before theater movie screenings, you do see uh, uh, an ad that talks about helping, coming forward to help. Uh, what it doesn't mention is that you have rights and those rights can't be violated. Uh, Dr. Soy asked about what if somebody does violate your rights? Well, uh, they will have to go to prison for that because uh, when they violate your rights under this specific law, it is contempt of Supreme Court. And contempt of Supreme Court can be punishable by a jail term regardless of whether they are a police officer, whether they are an IS officer, whether they are uh, a hospital staff, they can be punished very severely. The hospital can actually lose its license as well if uh, they uh, have this practice. But we recently carried out a survey and almost 50% of the doctors themselves are not aware that this law exists. Uh, majority of police were not aware. We have trained about 3,500 police personnel last year in uh, basic trauma care skills and not a single one of them in 10 states was aware that there is a good Samaritan law and that they have to uh, insulate and protect those who come and help and not harass and intimidate them. So it is a huge challenge. Uh, we need your help. We need all of your help. We need everybody's help to propagate the word. Um, looking at states enacting their own independent state laws, and we've had success with, with Karnataka, Delhi, and Maharashtra. Uh, just last week, I met Tamil Nadu, which has also agreed to have its own uh, state Good Samaritan law, which will help in creating awareness within the state around this system. But it's taking way too much time, and we are kind of uh, uh, not equipped to uh, provide uh, that knowledge and that awareness to everyone. So I would urge all of you uh, to use social media to, um, you know, uh, to spread the word. And if, if any of you uh, are hassled or you know somebody who's been hassled, all you have to do is to go to goodsamaritanlaw.in, goodsamaritanlaw.in, that's the website, and you can lodge a formal complaint. If it's serious enough, we will, pay, we will take up the issue with the state government, and if the state government doesn't uh, help uh, you, we will file a contempt petition in the Supreme Court on your behalf and get you justice in that uh, scenario. That is one part. Very, very nicely answered, but that is one part. Please tell me honestly. Keep your hand on your heart. If somebody is bleeding in front of you, somebody is dying in front of you, will you be, be fearful of the police or for detention? Tell me honestly. We are Indian emotional people. Will you be fearful? Will you be afraid of touching him? Silence, huh? Yes. You won't be afraid of? Dr. Amit Gupta said, even if you save one life in your whole life, it is worth it. But can't we, how insensitive we can be, one human being, it, it may be our uh, uh, friend, sis, brother, sister, our countryman, our statesman, or even the citizen of the world, the uh, global citizen, is dying in front of us. And we shamelessly, we, what we do is we start shooting videos, start taking pictures, and uh, start posting on the, I just comment on, this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, the, on the Facebook, or maybe on the social media sites. But ca can't we, yeah, one you have a protection, for the, with, the, with the law. But even if the law, forget about the law for, for, the, for the ones, because once you want to help someone, you won't think about the law. You will first go and uh, help someone to save his or her life. No? Can't we, because of this road safety session, can we commit to ourselves that we will not see this kind of uh, happening in front of us? Can yes. we commit to ourselves? Say yes, no? Yes. Let us, let us have one yes in one, one voice. Can you say yes? Yes. So when we started off this, uh, so I started Save Life Foundation after losing a family member in a road crash. And uh, it was my 15-year-old cousin who was uh, returning from school, was hit by a car, he was lying on the road for a very long time in his school uniform, uh, did not get help from any passers-by and died on the side of the road. And my first thought was exactly what Dr. Soe said, that we are so apathetic, we just don't care, we are insensitive. But in the course of my research, I discovered that uh, that was not entirely true. 
every time India has a building collapse or a train crash or even a bomb blast, the first people to come forward and help the injured are bystanders and passers-by. Even before, in most rail crashes, even before officials arrive, most victims have been shifted to hospital in tractor trolleys by uh, common people, by bystanders and passers-by in that scenario. What we discovered very conclusively was that it was a very profound fear of legal and procedural hassles that even held back those who wanted to help, who were not shooting videos, who are there, who have stopped despite going to office to see what is going on and they want to help and they can do that. So the profound fear has been instilled in our system not recently. The Bombay Police Act was amended by the British to ensure that not just the freedom fighters who are coming to hospital are documented, but those who are bringing the freedom fighters are also documented. And that is when the system started. So it has been generations and generations of system where people who have taken victims to hospital have been detained, have been harassed. And it will take a little bit of time to change that. But I think the Good Samaritan Law and the awareness that we are creating through this session and through other means and uh, what Dr. Soy just uh, made you do will help us overcome that generational challenge that we've been facing for almost 100 years now. So it will take some time, but I will assure you, sir, that I don't think everybody is apathetic. I think 30%, 40%, 50% might be, be apathetic, but there are always five out of 10 people on the scene who are there with a bottle of water, who are calling, or at least calling for help, or trying to do something. And those are the five people who are the ones who will bring the change that we want to see on the roads in our country. Just to add, uh, nicely, you know, quoted, just to add, you know, the incidents which you talked about, railway track um, accident, you know, or mass casualty incidents, or, or a bomb blast, there the whole society feels that something wrong has happened, you know, and, and they would come forward. But a single person injured on a road, the same feeling does not come. That will come only when you start feeling that that person is you. That means that person can be you at any point of time and it can be tomorrow, it can be the next hour. We all are so vulnerable to uh, road traffic injuries or, or accidents in general, you know, even construction site or agriculture, that we will have to understand and ingrain in our, in our minds that we can be the next person on the road. Till that time that, that realization happens, I think, I think it will not make a difference. One thing more, which uh, this because this is this is very very close to my heart. In this shape, form, and size, name, parentage, maybe country also. Even if we go by Hindu mythology, we are not going to take birth again. Right or wrong? Are we going to take birth again in the same shape, form, size, name, parentage, country or state or whatever? We are not. So let us do one small act of helping someone who is in distress, who is injured on the road. One life saved will save many, many lives and we will have safer Indian roads. Now let us have questions from the audience. Yeah. So I would like to ask uh, how this SOS really helps the people. Uh, is there any automation that we people are looking into uh, whenever there is an accident happens, why don't we uh, make it as a mandatory that uh, there is an SOS system in everywhere that makes really helps in indicating that something is happening on the roads. That's really helping on them. So uh, uh, what you're talking about is basically uh, in other language it will be called a universal access number which is a easy to remember simple number which is the starting point of uh, emergency care for or help for somebody who's injured. Uh, India has typically not had a universal access number. We've had multiple numbers. So Delhi, for example, has 100, 101, 102, 1033, 1098, 1066, 1096 for all different kinds of emergencies. Recently, 112 has been allocated by TRAI as the universal access number for the country. So far, two states have adopted it, uh, Nagaland and Himachal. There's a third state which is, I think, a month away or two months away from adopting it, that's Tamil Nadu. But once the universal access number comes, even a three-year-old will be able to remember that 112 is the number to call, whether somebody has had a road crash or a heart attack or fire or whatever it is. There will be a single SOS or a single number 
to call like 911 in the US or 112 uh, in uh, Europe and so on and so forth. So universal access number is the need of the hour. That is where the help starts. And that is something that we are hoping that over the next couple of years, the country will be able to adopt. We are a very, very diverse country with many national, many states and many languages and uh, stuff like that. So we have certain difficulties. We, last, we are trying this number from last four years. Okay. Sometimes the file gets stuck in Ministry of Road Transport Highways. Sometimes it gets stuck in the Ministry of Home Affairs. Sometimes states are like only two states have adopted so far. And few states are in the process of adopting this number. And I'm sure this number like 911 or 112 or uh, in uh, UK and uh, Europe, this number will also be very uh, helpful in all the emergency situations. This is a number for all the emergency situations, whatsoever it may be. So it will trigger all the agencies involved, all the stakeholders. May it be an ambulance, may it be a police, may it be a fire tender, may it be any kind of emergencies. Any more questions? Sir, the first ad course The first ad course, what uh, you said just now, it is a very important point. Uh, while issuing a license, if you can able to add that as a certifying uh, uh, one of the parameter, I think everybody can able to initially understand, can we make it compulsory, I mean? That's what I'm saying. We, we are, uh, try, you know, this uh, last government, we tried few uh, innovations and few uh, Positives in the this kind of few changes on uh, the issuing of driving licenses, like even biometrics are coming in various states. So similar, uh, I, I believe that maybe in this coming few years we will have first training, first aid training mandatory for uh, issuing a driving license. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Inayat. I'm a researcher, and uh, I just wanted to take on from the point that uh, Mr. Piyush had raised about. Uh, you know how critical it is for investigation into uh, the cause of the crash and then into the cause of the injuries and fatalities is. Uh, the WHO had uh, issued uh, guidelines for journalists who are reporting on uh, road traffic injuries. And I have been conducting an analysis of these media reports, all of them uh, you know, in English media. And what we found is that the understanding of even journalists is that accidents or crashes are accidents. And they fail to sort of cover the systemic uh, uh, you know causes so I wanted to know from you what do you think is the role of the media in advocacy in framing the issue um, uh, and then also you know in taking it forward as far as policy is concerned and a follow-up question to Dr. Soe um, you know what I mean does the National uh, Road Safety Council envision the media as a stakeholder as a partner uh, in India, we often say that, you know, the media is the fourth pillar of democracy. So when it comes to road traffic injuries, are we engaging with the media to report it uh, and um, sort of position the issue in, uh, you know, a larger sense? Uh, the second question which you asked about the media role in uh, National Road Safety Council. Yes, it's there. We, the media in India is very, very active. Rather, I'll say hyperactive. They will uh, definitely and surely report all the road accidents and fatalities, as well as the injuries happening to various uh, people uh, on the roads. And as far as the ex exact and correct reporting is concerned, I'm not very sure about it. Reason being, accident investigation, scientific accident investigation is really very scientific and is very technical. And very, very few people in the country leave aside the uh, investigating officer, the inquiry officers, Although we trained few people in Himachal Pradesh through a project called uh, RADMS, Road Accident Data Management System, and uh, in Tamil Nadu also, the, the, these are the two states where RADMS or maybe Karnataka is, uh, has, has been started, uh, involved with that World Bank project in Himachal. So there we trained uh, how to scientifically investigate a road accident and road crash with real-time data. Uh, but to take it to the scales to all the states is still very early days in India. And I'm sure the, the way media has evolved or has revolved will make some changes, will make some positive impact. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so far, I think the role, of, the role of media has definitely improved in the last 
uh, four or five years. In this uh, space, we are seeing a lot more in-depth pieces, a lot more uh, uh, framework and system level uh, pieces. Uh, but it's largely been disappointing for me coming from a victim side and coming from, you know, as an advocate for the issue. And the reason it's been disappointing is that, uh, let's forget about crash investigation for one uh, moment. Uh, if there is a spot from where every year three or four buses would fall into Bias River, shouldn't that be questioned by someone? It doesn't require scientific crash investigation, right? It only so what we see is you open page number nine or ten today also you will see a small snippet saying nine people killed, ten people killed. So what the media is mo largely doing is reporting numbers. What media is not doing is asking questions. Why is it from the same spot every year four buses will fall into Bias River, right? Why is it that the same spot on Yamuna Expressway is the spot where uh, X number of people are you know are dying almost every week? So. The media has demonstrated that if they ask the right questions, changes can happen. Change can, change, can, change can be brought. It is a matter of asking the right questions, right? So the WHO media training, I was a faculty for one of the training programs, so there was a lot of interest in, uh, in, you know, in the room. But there were 12 or 13 journalists uh, you know, sitting in that uh, workshop, or, or maybe 15. And the scale at which we're talking is very, very different. So I think if, they, if the media does just what journalists are supposed to do, which is ask questions, and consider this to be an issue where you're not just reporting statistics but also asking questions. I think that's the first achievement that we will have as far as sensitizing and changing is concerned. The technicalities, the specificities, we are there, and, uh, you know, NRSC is there, Dr. Gupta is there. We are here to share the specifics and the technicalities of the issue as spokespersons or as whatever. But I think the basic job of asking questions has to happen. And I think that's been hugely disappointing and I'm not seeing it change at all. One, one last question, because we're already running out of time. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hinotoli, and I'm working with the India Smart City um, uh, Fellowship. Uh, I'm working on a traffic monitoring, and so, uh, but my question is, yes, the panels have di discussed about the education and awareness, but, uh, and also about the safety, they're talking about that, including in a driving license, but I also, like, is it possible to add on to the school curriculum and even the college curriculum? Because apart from that, not everyone is into, yes, it's important to get a driving license to, like, you know, but it's not necessary that uh, to know, to get, uh, I mean, it's really also important that safety about the first aid, it's not really required to get, uh, like, driving license as well. So you need, if in case we need to, like, have an awareness or mainstreaming of, the do's and don'ts. Do we have? Can we include that in a school or uh, college curriculum? Because I don't think we don't have that in our system as well. So if in case we are talking about the education, so it starts from like you know from the pre uh, like when from a very like young age. So if in case in case that can be added on to the educational side. Like although I it is, uh, uh, I, I, although it is there inside the uh, old primary books as well. Stop, look, go. You might have all might have uh, read this. Stop, look, and go poem. And even in few universities, uh, like Punjab University, Chandigarh, and uh, three, four universities in Punjab, we have been able to uh, get a compulsorily paper, the examination of uh, road safety and uh, environment, to get a degree. If you don't clear that examination, you will not get a degree. So apart from that, CBSC uh, and all the school education boards they have included the uh, road safety as part of their curriculum. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, sir, you are right that uh, uh, as a country or in India at least, we are not very much aware of safety. Safety on road is a separate matter. If we, can, if we keep it aside, even at home, there are so many unsafe and uh, things which uh, we do. Children play with the plastics, plastic balls, small things. So those are the things which uh, need to be looked into. But you are right that this thing has to come from uh, the very beginning of the school level. Uh, we hope that uh, this happens. Uh, it has been discussed at uh, uh, MORTH and NCRT level. And uh, they have their own ways of putting this in curriculum. They are trying to put it. But uh, it is taking time. But 
World over it is there. We have in Canada and US, we have safe, uh, safe kids and uh, they have curriculum starting from, from the very beginning. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope and believe that whosoever is sitting here listening will become a road safety ambassador and will convey this message to your near and dear ones, friends and circle and social media that let us make Indian road safe. Let's make a uh, slogan that road, let us make road safety a way of life. Thank you very much. With this, we conclude a very enriching and informative session on road safety needs. Thank you, dear panelists, for your invaluable time and uh, inputs. I now, re now request Dr. Soy to please hand over a, uh, a token of appreciation to all our speakers. To start with, Mr. Phil Allen. Can we have a round of applause for that? <laughs> Mr. Ryan Gayman. <laughs> Mr. Mahesh Ajoria. Mr. Piyush Tiwari. <laughs> Dr. Amit Gupta. <laughs> it's an honor and privilege for me to hand over the memento to Dr. Soy on behalf of Exhibitions India. Thank you audience, thanks a lot for your patience. 